sites in the field of military heritage, but he's also one of the founding uh, uh, members of EFFORTS. Uh, EFFORTS is the uh, European uh, Association, uh, Federation, sorry, uh, European Federation for Fortified Sites. Uh, this uh, uh, organization was created uh, one year ago in the, in the Netherlands, so in a way you're new in the European family. So it would be interesting to, to see uh, what you've learned o o over these, these years by meeting actually your, your counterparts uh, at, uh, at European level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, EFFORTS is, is a new organization on uh, military heritage. Uh, that, um, and adaptive reuse is, is one of the main topics of this organization. So not only safeguarding, but also enhancing heritage, as it is also stated in the uh, Article 3.3 uh, of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, uh, we, we have uh, about three pillars. That's, uh, one pillar is advocacy. As today, statement is signed. We had also a, a declaration at our uh, annual meeting in uh, Venice, uh, 9 and 10 of November. We had our annual conference at Forte Maghera, a uh, beautiful fortress, 40 acres in, in Venice. Um, the second uh, is uh, the sharing of knowledge, sharing of expertise, as you are also <coughs> doing today at your conference. And, um, and the third pillar is external funding. And we also look for funding to, uh, to actually do something with uh, built heritage, with military heritage. And uh, an example from yesterday is that together with the Ramon Le Maire um, uh, Institute, which uh, Professor Van Bala is also uh, the director of, uh, we, were, uh, we put in uh, an interact project on uh, adaptive reuse and on carbon uh, reduction in, in, um, in heritage buildings. So what have we learned from this year's initiatives? A um, very nice in initiative is from, from my neighbor on, the, on your uh, uh, left-hand side. Uh, Future Religious Heritage had an initiative called The Torch, and maybe Lilian can uh, tell you a little bit more about that uh, uh, later. The Torch was an initiative this year to collect people's personal de uh, devotion to build heritage of a, let's say, religious nature. And re renovation projects require large public investments, and balance, balanced choices have to be made where to invest scarce and often public funding. So by engaging citizens, as uh, Average did this year with the TORCH initiative, increasing, um, it, it, that could increase the occupancy rate and, and that would justificate investments uh, we do in built heritage. Multi-purpose use is the key to safeguard heritage buildings and I believe that the, the sharing economy that we are in at the moment can also be an important key to improve multi-purpose use of the EU, EU stock of built heritage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lilian, you, you've already been uh, mentioned. I mean, you, you, you're an expert and a consultant in the adaptive reuse of uh, churches and, uh, and or temples in, uh, in the Netherlands, but you're also the, the Council uh, Honorary Secretary of Future for Religious Heritage, which is not a new organization, but uh, which is now supported by Creative Europe. So in a way, you, you, you're also uh, even more part of the European family and uh, you've been part of also of the stakeholders committee of the of the year so uh, what, what has been your, your experience with, uh, uh, with with this year and what, what would you uh, what have you learned from it actually well uh, it works i think as you know europe is a mixture of different countries many different approaches situations in different stages and formats legislational difference different in challenges but all have one common ground as what is interesting for all of us here is a lot of empty and abandoned buildings and heritage and the necessity of the states is and the obligation is to build a Europe for the future generations to live in so you all have a fair role to play there which adapts to their needs and I thank the Commission because it, it gave us a lot of clarity also for our conference in Paris which was in October in the UNESCO and with the engagement of UNESCO, the four pillars that you stated in the beginning of the year that we have seen, like engagement, sustainability, protection, and innovation, 
along these pillars we can build on for the future as they are sustainable and immediately touch upon the interdisciplinary approach. Because it's, none of them is mentioned heritage, but heritage is in all of them. And I think that's very important. Alongside these pillars, it was very clear and inspir inspirational to look at the other types of heritage, such as industrial and military heritage. The industrial heritage came from neglected, neglected, abandoned, polluted, to being fancy, embraced by many cities and city planners, and by the public. Let's hope we, from the pillar of religious heritage, will manage the same, as it is always taken as granted, this type of heritage. But we are on the threshold of losing it through a real society shift. It has always been in the midst of society, and we need to find a new place, new uses, new transitions and functions, stepping into the needs of today's society in order to maintain and keep the buildings. And what today was also very learning from one of the speeches really highlighted me. I thought it's all about trends. Maybe it's not even about the buildings anymore, but what is happening in these buildings? What is important for society? There is an overlap, but there are clearly also very specific differences between the, the types of heritage. The overlap is reuses of all times. Demolition of a building, which has been not touched upon today, but we face this in huge numbers, has huge impact on the environment. This is often forgotten as business models calculation starts always with an empty site and then start calculating the okay, exploitation model of a new building. The questions, what should happen to these abandoned heritage which have lost their original use? This question has a legal, economic, social, cultural and political dimension and this counts for all different types of buildings. Who is the owner? What are the rights and the obligations of the user and the owner? Who decides about the ab abolishment, reuse or demolition? The consequences of protection, which are also facing upon all the different types of buildings. But specific differences for the, for the religious heritage are the spiritual dimension, the emotions attached, the interiors and the important art pieces, objects and stories related to it, which are very often rooted in the local society, the morphology of the buildings, the different answers and approaches of each country according to the relations between church and state. Furthermore, the social debates which, which are sometimes very diverse and give extreme opinions. The urgency, that's a real difference because we are really, there's a lack of awareness of losing it. Religious buildings are taken for granted, built for the everlasting, they will last forever, is the thought. But this biggest portfolio of cultural heritage in Europe is under serious threat due to the change in patterns of worship attitudes to religion and reductions in government spending. In some countries, such as the Netherlands, you saw today on the screen, churches and monasteries are closing at an unprecedented rate with the consequent loss of local history, social amity and art. The threat to many of these buildings is, is real and urgent. The Netherlands, two churches close a week. I know that uh, the professor said, Wessel de Jonge said one, mm. but it's one monastery a month, two churches a week, and we are facing the loss of 2,000 buildings, and we are in a flat country of the Netherlands, especially here in Friesland, it's very flat. Can you imagine what will happen when we will abandon these buildings and they will be demolished? For instance, the statement of the uh, Catholic Church in the Netherlands officially up to, till today is demolition is better than giving a new purpose or new use. So this is a real threat. It's real and urgent. If measures are not taken quickly, the trick, the trick of closures and destructions already witnessed across Europe risks becoming a flood. Next to it is that 87% of the European citizens, all of us, consider this heritage as important for their community and want to have it used more broader if this will support the maintenance. So we learned, we learned a lot during the year looking at the other um, heritage sites like industrial and military. There's a lot in common, but there's also a real difference. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. This is uh, already uh, a statement in, uh, in advance, which has covered uh, many points uh, to which we, we, we will come back. 
But uh, at this stage, uh, I would like to take uh, your point on uh, industrial heritage and the way actually uh, such a heritage uh, which was associated to uh, pollution, uh, dirty uh, uh, factories uh, in the run-down areas with broken glasses have in a way uh, become trendy and we've seen uh, this morning several uh, creative hubs or uh, incubators actually uh, hosted in uh, former industrial buildings and it's true that it's in, in a way trendy for the creative community. So uh, Hildebrand, uh, since you've set the trend, uh, so you are uh, uh, the managing director of the Dutch Foundation for Industrial uh, Culture, but uh, you are also one of the founders of ERI, European Route for Industrial Heritage, which is also a creative uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, network. So since uh, it's, it has partly become trendy to actually uh, refurbish industrial buildings to, to host uh, all sorts of uh, activities, have you still, anyway, learned uh, anything from actually uh, this dialogue with other sectors uh, this year? Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, huge, yes, uh, certainly we have, but something which is also remarkable, because that we um, are afraid perhaps we do our work too well. And I, I give you an example. Uh, we had a conference uh, of Erie in uh, Silesia, in, in Oberschlesien, Katowice and uh, surroundings. And then we could hardly find one uh, of these old factories, which is real, still smelling, which is <laughs> breaking out tons of, 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 of smoke. It was all was very clean. And, there was only one uh, Koch's fabriek. I, I don't know that in English so well. Uh, do you know that in English? Koch's fabriek and the Kokerai. Mm -hmm. uh, Koch's, Koch's factory in the Buton, the former Boyton, and that was still really uh, in the beginning of the evening, wet weather, giving the right historic uh, scenery of, of, of industrial culture of the 19th century. So we are losing that, but on the other hand, we are uh, preserving uh, lots of industrial heritage, and this is an ongoing process because we're speaking nowadays about um, industrial culture, and uh, it becomes always more and more industrial culture. Now we have the fourth industrial revolution, uh, certainly there will be a fifth, and, and this brings a new industrial heritage to us, and which we have to be careful of. What I learned, and that is, is that how important such a year of European cultural heritage is for the status of the, the heritage. And now, though a lot of industrial heritage <coughs> is our cultural heritage, I mean, every new function which is uh, translated in buildings and in systems uh, uh, after, after, after the first industrial revolution is industrial culture. I mean, it's not only factories, it's our post offices. You can imagine everything which you did not have before let's say 1720, uh, that's, that's industrial culture, and that's quite a lot in our society. We are loaded with it, and uh, we are interested in to, to raise the status of it even more and more, and I think last 20 year, years that has happened, because it was quite, as you say, neglected matter of fact, uh, especially in connection with uh, visitors, trying to uh, attach visitors, interesting people, uh, uh, to come to this kind of heritage that was when you, when you were working on that, and I had several colleagues who, who were working in the 90s and the 80s in, in conservation departments like I did, they said, well, yeah, uh, you, 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 you were dealing with tourists now, now, no time for that. It's not interesting for us because we have hands full of our conservation activities. But uh, and it was, was not, there was not a kind of marketing of this fascinating heritage which is now, and now it is uh, obvious, of course, we do that, that uh, this rising of status and even <coughs> In Berlin at this summit, and I had the honor to be in the first meeting uh, in uh, Leuven uh, in the February uh, to be on the summit. And now you are so grateful. I'm so grateful to you that I, I'm allowed to come here at, at, at this, this last uh, big event of uh, of the European year. That's very fine. But I, I saw in uh, in in Berlin that even uh, the president of Federal Republic of Germany, Walter Steinmeier, was raising this topic and was uh, uh, bringing a wonderful speech about the European values, uh, especially also of industrial heritage and religious heritage and military heritage. You have here three, three guys here on a row which, which represent something which is for Europe of hugely importance and also of the feeling of a certain kind of 
of unity uh, uh, for us as Europeans. I'm very European, you know. First I'm Frisian, because I come from here. Then I'm European, and then I'm Dutchman. You know, that's, 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 that's about, yes. That's, I, I, I wonder if I should say that, but I really feel that, because how, how, how connected we are with all, all, the, all, even the farthest corners of Europe, we are connected. And certainly over these topics, this religious uh, 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 heritage is something of Europe. You know? it, it has spread over the world out of Europe. And that's the same with the military heritage and all its, its uh, theoretical uh, uh, approaches from Italy and the Netherlands, which have had huge influence all over the world. And the industrial heritage, well, we are here in the first uh, uh, Europe uh, as the first industrial continent. So, this, so it is very necessary that we take it so serious. On the other hand, if, if I may, uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, at last, you know, it's an important point. Uh, this status means also uh, the consequence that we have to be, that, that there will be more adaptive reuse of industrial heritage. Because they say it is it's important, we cannot demolish it as such, uh, and, and we want to do something with it. I think it's better than to demolish it, but you can also destroy it partly by adaptive reuse. So I would, and I, I don't mind for that, when this industrial, when it is normal, common in, in the industrial heritage, uh, you have plenty of it all around, and says, okay, we, you feel free. But there are certain kinds of industrial heritage which are so precious, uh, and we, which are, uh, became seldom, uh, uh, which you have to be very careful, uh, which you should uh, don't touch too much. And uh, in the, I would wish that there will happen something in Europe, in the countries where it didn't happen before, and that's why I put some governmental input on, on this uh, uh, statement. You're coming to, uh, you're coming to that. Uh, that is that at least in every European country, we look carefully what do we have, and that's, I think, something for the states to do, state officers of, of uh, conservation department, what do we have on industrial culture in our, uh, industrial heritage in our country, of, of the different branches, what has been left, yeah, what are the differences within these branches, and what has been left, and what is still inside, is there still uh, equipment inside, and this, this we, inventorized in the Netherlands in the years 92, 96. We made 40 volumes uh, of, of, of the study of the different branches. And since that period, we know exactly what are the core values of industrial heritage so that we know what we should not touch, what is really, it's the top of the bill, there we have to be careful. And all the other things, we can make it a little bit more democratic, so to say, in, 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 in new processes. I would, I would, when you would say, what, what would you wish for Europe? This is one of the things I hope that will happen also in every country. So that you feel free as architects. Oh, this here we can. Uh, this is a building which, which I really can play with without feeling guilty. So you know, this I think this, I wish that for you. I wish that you are very free citizens of Europe, also in your in your uh, uh, devoted activities as architects. I think this is for the fourth, first term. I'm sorry, I always speak too long. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's okay. Plus, uh, if you uh, uh, step in to, in a way, build a case for religious or military heritage, I think this is very nice, and this is very much in line with the spirit of the Don't of the year. So this is uh, this is very welcome. Uh, well, we've heard the heritage experts so far, uh, Georg. Uh, Obviously, you represent uh, uh, architects, and the idea of this initiative and uh, of the year, because uh, AIS is, is, is also now a Creative uh, uh, Europe, uh, Creative Europe supported uh, uh, network. So the idea was to put uh, architects and heritage experts uh, together, because you all know that uh, architects uh, blame uh, heritage uh, experts or ayatollahs and uh, vice, uh, vice versa. Uh, for missed opportunities or missed uh, uh, projects. Do you think that this, uh, this year, this year of dialogue, exchange, uh, has helped in a way, or that uh, at least uh, we are on the right track? I, I, I hope so. Um, I think this, uh, you are quite right. Uh, there is a kind of a, uh, not very relaxed dialogue sometimes between the uh, heritage people, let's say it like this, and the, the architects who under the suspect that they rather want to demolish everything and build everything new. And uh, I think this is a bit also from the past because as we also have learned today by many lectures, it's obvious that 
we have an enormous building stock which is uh, unused or not used and which needs, which can be reused. We have the issue of uh, sustainability and demolishing always means to lose in a certain way value, uh, no, not only value in, 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 in the uh, intellectual value sense, but also value in the ma purely material sense. If you have to demolish a building, you have to pay a lot. Luckily, it gets even more expensive because you have to separate a bit more, so it's, a, it's actually an improvement of this situation. And uh, I would say that the architectural profession and uh, even more the, the, the young architects are, are very clearly committed to the, to the thing that uh, reuse, that you use what is there. And so in this, this, from this respect, uh, out, starting from this respect and also from the uh, point of view that uh, I would say that generally in, in architecture the, the, the thought of contextuality is, is stronger than it, let's say, has been 30 years ago. <clears throat> so it's a question of education, it's, uh, it's a question of... Uh, uh, integrating a project, as also if it's just simply a new project, uh, better to the fabric of the city, uh, of course also because it gets better accepted and used by the people. And this is, this is also concerning new buildings. And uh, I think we are on a good track to close the gap between, uh, with her between the heritage people and the architects. And because actually, I would say that the major thing is, is the question of quality. You can have uh, also old buildings which might not have this high quality, and still sometimes they are to be not protected, but they're not listed. And it's also very important to see that we have, of course, listed buildings which are well protected, but I rather think a lot about all those built heritage which, are, which is not listed, but which still have, has the value to, to be used and, and, and refurbished, etc. So the major, major point is the point of quality, and, and this, this counts for the old as it counts for the new. And this is a common sense of all of us, I think, and there we are pulling in the string in the same direction. So I don't see a, a real problem getting further on this track. And maybe a quick uh, follow up question. Do you think that the Davos declaration on the high quality Bokul 2 has uh, helped also to, to, or is helping to promote this uh, integrated approach? Uh, do you see the better? I, I, th I think yes, very much, because it was also there already uh, written in a very proper form, in a very good way. And actually, as the Davos Declaration really has created a momentum, which is now going through all European countries in a way, uh, it's a good opportunity and a good chance to, to uh, jump on the train and continue to talk about Baukultur. It's, it was, of course, it's a German uh, word, Somebody said today it's, it's German, it's not, it's also Switzerland, Switzerland, Austrian, it's the German-speaking um, mid-European area where we have to develop the term as it allowed us to get more allies. This is one thing, of course, and it's a bit a more holistic approach. We don't uh, only talk about the design, we talk also and think about processes, about planning processes, about all the stakeholders who are part of the, of the developments. And... Uh, it was for us, it was very useful because it shall be not easy to, to, to use the term in whole Europe as, of course, it's, it needs a certain understanding which you don't learn within, uh, learning is a bit a bad word, but which you don't adapt within a few months or even not within a year. It was also in, in our countries, it was developed since the late 90s. It took a long time that we got a bit of general understanding. And of course, one should neither go that far to talk only about Barkultu because then the general public doesn't hear any more anything about architecture. So it's, it's a bit, therefore I like quite much the, the term of, of high architectural quality and Barkultu. I think this is a, it has them both. Yeah, it's difficult to translate uh, indeed. Uh, but the Davos Declaration actually has been signed by, by ES, but also by Europa Nostra. So actually, uh, heritage uh, and uh, experts and architects uh, were in agreement uh, then. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, Kuhn, we already know that you, you are the director of the Raymond Le Maire International Center for Conservation, but you're also a, a council member of Europa Nostra, and you're also the, the chair of the jury 
uh, in the category uh, conservation, a jury for European uh, Heritage uh, Prize. So you have uh, an overview, you, you've dealt uh, with this issue for, for, for a long time. What is your, your, your take on this after one year? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, maybe I should ask a question. Uh, so a little bit of action from your side. So who has read Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe? Okay, it's very interesting. Uh, Europa Nostra was leading a project which was preparing, I think maybe be at the origin in some way or another of the European of Cultural Heritage. And I think there are two main concepts which have been developed at that, in that document. And the most important one maybe is to say how from the point of view of working to a sustainable world, cultural heritage can contribute to generate that, even in areas which have originally not to, to do anything with culture. So in a certain sense, cultural heritage is a way, is a way of activating sustainable development. I think that some of the examples that we have seen today in a certain way can be translated in that sense. It is also building on the concept of cultural heritage, as, as the, um, the concept of sustainable development as it was developed by UNESCO in the forecast of reviewing the Millennium Goals. So it was assumed that there would be much more about cultural heritage in the development goals. Now we have only 11.4. Um, and it assumed that Sustainable development would be on four pillars, which are ecology, or environment, economy, sociology, and culture. And that was crucial. Now, coming back to what we learned. And so I, um, what we have been doing in that report, and we did a big chunk of that research uh, at our institute, is in fact a finding which was completely different from the original question, because the original question was, can you demonstrate what is the impact of cultural heritage? Which would be like, what is the impact if you invest in cultural heritage? And the finding would be completely different. And we found this kind of new insight based on a number of item, reasons. One of them is probably the time we are looking very differently to what is going around in our world. And I think the fact that we, are, we put so much attention in uh, local societies and the involvement of societies is because, in certain sense, we have overlooked those societies in the past. Uh, so we have, to give, we have to make some corrections. So that's the time uh, line. Um, that's a very important uh, element which makes us look uh, differently. So, from that concept, we have been looking for many, many different cases. And I think what happened during this year, that is, we have seen more cases. I think we have increasingly been confident about the finding that we have made. But at the same time, we have also seen, and I think that's also partially the, the role of Europa Nostra, in which way it can also activate people and inspire people. And to look, I think somebody said it earlier today, we, we do not have to look in a negative way. We have just to see the strength. What, is, what does cultural heritage contribute to the future? I think it's, it's part of that same game because we are looking at sustainable development and how do we position cultural heritage in that? Not only as, an, as a fabric, as stones and bricks, but also the way how we can regenerate parts of our society in, in taking care of themselves and taking care of others. What I also learned by every time trying to explain part of those uh, things is how deep is this notion, how deep is this understanding about the role of cultural heritage for each of us. And one way of, I, re, I could refer to the Nobel Prize of Medicine 2014, John Keefe and May, the couple, Nor Norwegian couple Moser, and they developed, or they developed the understanding about 
the grid cells. And what is the grid cells? Grid cells are something that we have in our brain, so our neurons, and what they do, they connect place and memory. So it means it's something that we don't even have to agree upon. It's something which is the way we live, the way we work. It makes us possible that even if we don't see, we will not, we have one C and we know where the wall is, we will not hit the wall again, even if we don't see it. So it means how essential it is. And so if you connect that, that understanding about place and memory, I think it explains a lot of things that we are talking about. It explains, and therefore I would refer to a very interesting document uh, that you can find on the, on the website of the National Trust. And the document is named Places That Make Us. And that particular document shows at the same, a different, little bit different way, on the neuron level, but also on the social level, how, imp how important places are for us, individual, in our way of functioning as a body and neural system, but how we want to share this information with others. And it is exactly what we find in the Eurobarometer. It's very interesting. So the Eurobarometer, together with the Culture Heritage Council Europe report, are the basis for what helps us to understand what cultural heritage can contribute to the society. And I think what we have been doing and we are trying to do is to deepen that understanding. But I think it's important to, uh, to make that uh, reflection. What I also learned is that there are a number of things that we are not looking at and which are existing. How many of you know the Faro Convention? Okay, very little people know the Faro Convention. Do you, do you think the Netherlands have undersigned the Faro Convention? <laughs> Is it a Dutch coordinator in Europe? Yeah, there's somebody who can give the answer there at the back. <laughs> Not yet. I'm from the Ministry of Culture for okay. Alta, but we are working on it. We will okay. have a... When, what is the date? everything in Limburg next year. Yeah, what is the date of the fire convention? 1995. Okay, many years ago. It's interesting, if you see the, the countries which have undersigned and have applied the fire convention, they are most, mostly in the Balkan area and in the east of Europe. And what is interesting is that it is a document which exactly explains a lot of things we are talking about here, about how do you make the connection with, between society and, and heritage. So, I am surprised that, for example, the Fire Convention is something we talk very little about. It is there, and we maybe could push our governments to work uh, a little bit on, on that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think we can stop more or less here. Just to say what I learned, I learned many more, more things, but I think these are a few items. Or maybe just one more thing. Who knows the Berlin call? <laughs> the Berlin call for action. Yes? Okay, now we have more of this. No, those of you who do not know it, write down Berlin call for action. You Google it and you undersign it. Why? Because it is basically sell, telling us that this European year we learned a lot of things and we want in one way or another to have an inheritance of that in the future. So that was a little bit an agenda point. Thank you for, for sharing this. Regarding the FAO Convention, uh, I think we have a joint project with the Council of Europe to, to promote its uh, uh, ratification. So it's, we're also working on it, but uh, it takes time, as, uh, as you know. But this is one of the many dimensions, uh, indeed, of sustainable development and quality, as we understand it now. And that's why we work on this uh, quality issue from uh, different perspectives, uh, as I said, but because people uh, should be back at the center, it's not uh, only an aesthetic or an architectural issue, it's much more than, than that, so this is uh, consistent in a way with uh, what you've said. W would anyone in, in, in the room have a comment or an experience to, to share at this uh, stage? Since you, di you didn't read uh, Heritage Counts for Europe, maybe you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> this is your one chance to catch up. Otherwise, there will be another opportunity. So maybe we'll move on. Uh, because you all know and you receive it on, at, uh, at your uh, table, uh, a statement is, uh, is coming up. 
uh, which is in a way the, uh, the outcome of this, uh, of this uh, 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 initiative. Uh, but uh, I would like to take the opportunity actually to, uh, to ask the, 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 the various uh, uh, speakers uh, which uh, actually uh, message uh, they, they would like to, uh, to, to highlight uh, to make sure that you leave uh, with uh, a few uh, clear ideas on the, main, uh, on, the, on the main points. And maybe together it's a two-fold question. Uh, depending on your choice, how uh, would you see it uh, implemented or promoted in the future? What kind of concrete actions could, be, could promote what you think is the most important uh, uh, element, be it at, at European level or at national, regional level? But uh, we can only work at, uh, I mean, uh, uh, all together. Uh, so I, I will start with you, Hildebrandt, if you, if you don't mind. It's, a, it's, it's late Friday afternoon, and you see now the work comes to you. <laughs> you, were, you will be very busy during the weekend, certainly. But I try to uh, not to give you too much work because uh, you might not like that. What I would like to say is, and that, that's in, in a kind of reduction of the, I think, yes, I think what you said about a, a kind of controversy which can occur <laughs> between conservationists and uh, and architects who are busy with adaptive reuse. I, I have a, a different practices. Uh, I always work together with these architects, and especially in cases when we have the proof that a certain building or structure uh, can be reused better than demolished and put a new, something anew. Uh, and it, that's uh, most, mostly is the discussion also in the Netherlands. It, it becomes a little bit better nowadays, but uh, in the past it was really terrible. They say, yes, it's much cheaper when we demolish and put something new. And then I said, no, it's, I, I, I can't hardly imagine that. Uh, when you look at the quality of the building, so, I asked uh, architects who, uh, of which I knew in the Netherlands, they can also, they have a good knowledge about, uh, how you call it, uh, rechnen, rekenen, rekenen, accounting. Uh, about accounting, who, 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 because not every ar architect is available, of, uh, uh, has knowledge of course, but s some of them have, have very much knowledge of course, we work with them together, and then we, we prove that you could reuse the building. And then, and then uh, it was politically set through, so we are not allowing the demolishment. And so I think it is hugely important. I would put up this point. It might be still uh, actual uh, uh, to, to do that. Uh, try to work together with each other. And don't, don't uh, see it as, uh, uh, as, a, as a hidden enemy uh, uh, of the government. I think, I think uh, there is a lot of work to do in that case. And other thing is, uh, perhaps, and which is also referring to, uh, to this uh, wonderful document which is now coming through, that is the uh, importance, I think you also said something about it, it is that you have to measure, really to measure what are the, uh, uh, what is the environmental impact on uh, uh, demolishing put in you, in the, also in the uh, field of energy. I mean, the, 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 the energy, uh, the energy prestatie, the, the, the prestatie, prestatie. Performance. My, my English is getting very bad at the end of the week, sorry. The energy performance of both tracks, you know, adaptive reuse or... It's very important. And here we, we never make uh, this kind of exercise in the Netherlands to say that's the difference, you know. You have to do that. You should do that because that is, that is also one of the aspects. Then um, uh, another thing is and that I would really like to say, to have said, that is that we are very um, uh, 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 very interested, yes, that's, that's a very important point, I think. I want also to, to tell to you, and it has also to do with this, is the uh, conceptual, uh, the contextual values of, of uh, and, and they can be much broader than only the, the, the immediate context of a, of a building or a structure. And the, the, the value of your project is, is uh, Influence also by the, the value of the context of it. Uh, is the context preserved in some way? And I, I saw many uh, uh, examples which, 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 which made that less. For instance, I, I gave you only one in Torino, Italy. Uh, this wonderful, you know it all as architect, Lingotto factory or Fiat. It's, it's very famous. That at the same time I visited this factory three years ago, they were demolishing in the center of Torino. The, the direct predecessor of this factory, of, of, of which the system 
of the Lingotto factory was based, was destroyed. A, a completely well-ordered, fantastic building. And that's the broader context which is important and which is, which, which is neglected often. Uh, so uh, don't look only at the project as such, but also at the wider arrangement, which, which is one of the aspects of the value of it. Then, uh, oh, I, okay. Yeah, I, well, I, I want well, to invite, uh, uh, give an invitation, okay. but that's then the last thing I, I say. I would like to invite you to become a member of ERI and a member of Europa Nostra. We need architects in both, I think. I'm, I'm also an Europa Nostra active. And we, we need them in both organizations. And we can use much more architects in those organizations and, than now. And then the equilibrium between conservationists and mutualists and architects will even bring on a better level than it is now. I hope really to the E-R-I-H, and Europa Nostra, you know, of course. I will be very happy to meet you there on one of our conventions. Thank you very much. OK, so you have a lot of work to do now. Uh, thank you for, for this. Uh, maybe uh, the next speakers could try to focus on one specific issue so that we don't take Sorry. all the words from uh, Georg Smaus, who, who is supposed to uh, present the final uh, statement. So, uh, Hubert, maybe can you, uh, can you try? Thank you. Um, yeah, regarding the, your uh, statements of the AC, I, I have had specific interest for the environmental uh, dimension of adaptive reuse. Um, current evidence suggests that by 2050, an 80% reduction in carbon emission will be required by developed countries uh, to avoid the damaging levels of climate change. And um, uh, in Europe, built heritage counts for about 1 to 2 percent, so you could say, why bother? So 1 to 2 percent of the carbon emissions in the, of the total building stock. However, carbon emissions of those buildings are disproportionately high. Uh, at least 10 percent of total building, um, of the total uh, emission. So. Adaptive reuse, therefore, can be an important contributor, as aforementioned, at least 10%, to achieve an energy-efficient and decarbonized European building stock by 2050. And secondly, reusing heritage buildings already benefits carbon emissions by avoiding additional embodied carbon from new buildings as we save energy and materials uh, compared to demolition as also aforementioned. Uh, and thirdly, adaptive reuse also limits urban sprawl and land use. This contributes to preserving uh, biodiversity and, and nature values. So three uh, uh, contributions of uh, re retrofitting and, and uh, adaptive reuse of uh, built heritage on the environmental aspect as stated in the um, uh, statements of, of ACE. Yeah, thank you for that. I think they are very important points, and maybe or surely we, we will need to work more uh, on these points in, in, in the future. So, uh, I mean, with the research services, energy services of the U European Commission. And I think this is also actually something that is often uh, overlooked, uh, although it uh, actually uh, it's a strong argument and, and builds a, a strong case for, for adaptive re reuse. And it links also with what actually uh, uh, Oana presented uh, this morning uh, in connection with the Flemish Bormeister, who is also uh, uh, very, uh, who has a strong convic convictions in the uh, environmental benefits of uh, uh, adaptive reuse, which uh, you, you've just uh, described. So Lilian, your turn, please. OK, I would like to touch upon that it is very important, uh, the multidisciplinary and participatory approach. It's really a necessity. This also means, I think, that not only for all of us in the room, that we need to embrace this and try to work with it. And many of us already do, I think. But it's also that on EU level, this topic should be accepted, recognized, and embedded in future programs. And other disciplines, such as social cohesion, urban and rural planning, economics, and innovation. It needs to become a kind of mindset. 
Uh, we warmly work, welcome the highlight of the Bau Kultur concept, although it is not new, because many countries are already working in line, but it's really helpful that now all the ministers signed this document, and it will be, uh, I think, a, a kind of push in the back for everybody to move forward, and maybe we could all, as we discussed today, maybe architects should step more in politics, but maybe we can... You know, you can use these documents as the Faro Convention and the Bau Kultur and the, uh, in order to change mindsets of people who are responsible for urban planning and political planning. I think there are these issues. And, and so let's use these documents more as the Faro Convention already lasts for a long time and, and nobody in the room knows. This is our work. This is supposed to help all of us forward. And I also like to embrace this high quality architecture, which is very well mentioned there. And the knowledge of the architects is very important as one of the essential players in the jazz orchestra we were introduced to today mm -hmm. to compose the future melody of, Euro melody of Europe. So I think it's very important that we all embrace Baukultur and the multidisciplinary approach. That's very clear. Thank you. Uh, maybe, Kuhn, since uh, you, you've, you've been involved not only in the discussions, but you've worked on the issue for, for, for a long time, maybe... You, I mean, maybe it's difficult for you to highlight one dimension because we've seen that there are many of them, but maybe you can pr propose or suggest a, a number of uh, or some concrete actions yeah. for the future. Okay, so without concerting, we, I think I'm going uh, now, going on with what Lilian was saying. Um, and I just refer to one of the odd items which are in the document here, which are referring to multidisciplinary teams and collaborative uh, approaches. I would like to extend it uh, a little bit uh, for two reasons. Um, one is that we have, I think it has been mentioned only once during the time I was here, I was a little bit late, but I don't think it was addressed before, is the word of commons. Um, what, what is happening today, and I also refer to the social changes that we see nowadays increasingly coming up, is that people along or aside sometimes in opposition, sometimes in collaboration, are organizing themselves aside public authorities because they have to find solutions. And I think it's good that people are organizing themselves on a place. I, I made a reference before why places are important, but also heritage is very often place-based. So if we assume the importance of connection between those buildings and communities, I think we should look in a way how we can how this can be promoted, how it can be facilitated. That's one thing. The other thing that we have felt very much this year from, uh, from the side of Europa Nostra is that everybody was looking at us, yes, oh, we have a big problem in Europe, can you help us? And in a certain sense, yes, I think Europa Nostra is helping to create, to generate, reflect about what Europe is exactly about. Now it happens that a few weeks ago I was at a conference, at the Euromed conference, and I was asked to share a panel about cost projects. And there was one cost project, I will read the title and you will say, well, it has nothing to do with it, but anyway, it was reassembling the Republic of Letters from 1500 until 1800, a digital framework for multilateral collaboration on Europe's intellectual history. So it's basically a project which is looking at things letters which are in different places, but digitally you can bring them together. But the person who introduced this, uh, this cost project, who is Howard Hudson, uh, Hudson from uh, uh, Oxford University, he started with just showing on a map where people moved in the past. Erasmus, all the scientists. And if you would overlap all the places where those people moved, you have Europe. Mm. So in a sense, if you think about newspapers, you say, okay, what, what, uh, today we talk about what is Europe. The first thing people usually say is Erasmus. It's Erasmus, it's exchanges. So I would plea in a certain way if we cannot find a ways of uh, making this connection between these ideas of commons on different places and moving people. And because it will help us to understand what Europe is about, these diversities of identities and the diversities of the nature of cultural heritage and how su such a thing can be, be shared. So maybe not so much on the level of 
uh, education, but at a level of how we can exchange experiences, we can exchange good, good practices. Because when we are working on a local place, the risk is also that we forget about what's going on in other places, and we may misuse the ideas of identities that has been referred to here. But maybe by opening it to others, we may identify that our identity is just another identity. Mm -hmm. Just the way, the reason why at Europa Nostra we never use identity in the singular. We always talk about identities. So that would be just a proposal. Thank you. Okay, Georg, would you like to, to highlight one specific point before you present the statement, or you go straight to the statement? Well, perhaps both. I don't know. Yeah, well, I have my, my favorites, which are in the second chapter, actually, and this is, uh, I think, basically, it's the participation of the citizens. It's the kind of the chance to integrate users, citizens, in the planning processes, also to, yeah. Temporary uses, I think it's a very important and a very interesting chapter because it makes things partly easier. When we were talking before about the standards with the temporary use, you can sometimes do something which does not need to last for 100 years and so it can be a bit less expensive also. So it's, uh, it, it eases and we, uh, we know quite many examples where certain temporary uses then just simply stayed or temporary, especially temporary buildings are sometimes uh, of a very long lifetime, which is also good. So it's a bit a subversive uh, thing, which I always like. But this is a personal. And then, of course, this is, uh, this is nobody shall be surprised, quality-based procurement, because a lot of, of, of built heritage is in the ownership of the, of the public. And therefore, we are always of the opinion that uh, any procurement and any interventions uh, have to be quality-based and not cheapest offer uh, deciding or getting the job. Whereas in the planning process, or of course in the, in the material part of the procurement. So these were my three ones, I would say. Of course, good storytelling is a very, very, very good point. I think it needs it for the communication of any project. And, and yeah, it's, it's good storytelling is not marketing for me. It's a, it's a bit more. It's hard, it's hard to stick to one, uh, <laughs> one point, so you already know half of the, of, uh, of the statement. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the room would like to, to jump in, and uh, maybe it's too late to, to change the statement, but you can certainly share uh, a thought or ask a question. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question because of the, uh, the, the intriguing opening of this statement. Uh, about values, the values. Uh, uh, I read another book, uh, Mr. Van Baal, and it's uh, David Lowenthal, um, The Past is a Foreign Country, uh, Changing Values, uh, Each Generation Reshapes His Legacy, or even uh, To Inherit is to Destroy. Uh, what about the changing values in Europe instead of talking about the values? Because it, it, in my opinion, it looks a little bit to uh, absolute and not what is culture and values about, about changing values. So that, that intrigued me in this text. And the second one is that the ambition of the introduction, in my opinion, is too low. Uh, if you have an ambition, this, this looks to, in my, uh, in my opinion, as an introduction to an ambition because what are, we, what are the implications for education, for regulations, for planning, and so in these worlds. So um, I'm not really convinced that things will change if this is the statement or it might add up to a next action in uh, having influence with the statement. So the two things, the values and the implication of the statement. Thank you. Well, uh, I suggest, uh, Kuhn, maybe you, you can answer on the values, and then, oh, okay, there will be another question. Yeah. About the, the values, I, I think that you can read things always in different ways. Eh? Um, I think it doesn't, the way it is written it does not say that it not cha it's not changing. I think, but I, I think the way I made a comment this morning very briefly is there are methodologies to understand cultural heritage values. 
and those, the way we use it and we look at them today are different from the way how Raymond Le Maire, <laughs> who established our institute, was the author of the Venice Charter, has defined the values. Although, and it's very interesting, we recently had a PhD about Raymond Le Maire, and you would be sometimes surprised about his writings, about understanding of cultural heritage values, how actual they still are. The point is that things, documents sometimes get frozen, our words are interpreted. But I think that today, that's least, at least what we teach to our students, but I think it's also at the Europe, European level, as far as I understand, but maybe not for the people who are not here, because that's also, and we are sometimes preaching to the, con to the ones who are yet converted. Um, but, but I think there is a general understanding that this whole issue about cultural value is a methodological way of working and has different ways of how to fill it in. But you have to do it in a, and that's postmodern, transparent and an inconsistent way which is the definition of postmodernism, we are still in it. Education, mm -hmm. because education was also addressed. I think it's vital. Uh, I think this document is helpful because it will open a way. And for instance, um, Kuhn talked about Erasmus and the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, I think this year already contributed enormously with uh, the Gothenburg meeting where it was stated very clearly that culture and education is very important. And if I understood correctly from all the policy officers of Europe, is that the Erasmus Plus program will already be extended for the future and hopefully also will touch upon heritage a lot. But education is key. Uh, young architects, uh, I think, already are used to this interdisciplinary, it probably is part of their program in the educational system, I think, let's hope. <laughs> uh, and uh, also this exchange of views and traveling throughout Europe will give us and help us more, and it's really an experience I have myself, being in European projects, being able to travel uh, instead of just going on holidays, but really sharing uh, experiences really helps, and also on this, the Erasmus Plus uh, program touches very, well, very forcefully, I think. Yeah. I think there was uh, another question yeah, at the back, and then we, we come back to your second part. Yes, thank you. <laughs> to, to the statement, first of all, thank you for, for sharing uh, perspectives on, on heritage. But just a comment on, on uh, the statement, I didn't have a chance to, and I'm not looking into words, but it does, it does start from adaptive reuse, and I think uh, Mr. Van Balen, has, in a way, has stolen my schlagwort mentioning Venice Charter, because Venice Charter started one of the oldest charters from these conservationist or heritage people that we kind of mention as someone outside of the room. The Venice Charter said the continuity of use is the best and uh, you know, primary way of protecting. So we are in a way ex expanding on that through this, and it's not a bad statement, but c would I be correct in saying that it would be good that the statement is also endorsed by ICOMOS, because that is another multidisciplinary large network under which we all you know, pick and learn and apply in education a lot of the principles that are incorporated in this. So that's just a suggestion. Might it be offered to be supported because it might be stronger then? Thank you. Well, I, I can partly uh, answer. I mean, I, I think this is still uh, an open um, uh, option, but ECOMOS is involved in uh, uh, another project on actually, uh, which is in a way about uh, revisiting the, the, the Venice Charter because it's about uh, defining uh, quality principles, not standards, but quality principles for uh, heritage uh, interventions. <coughs> so there's an expert group uh, working uh, under the umbrella of e-commerce uh, who actually had uh, its final conference in Venice uh, yesterday and the, and the day before. And so uh, a, a final, uh, more technical and uh, in-depth uh, document will be uh, released on this more, uh, uh, on this specific uh, issue of quality, which includes uh, adaptive reuse, but which is not focused on adaptive reuse. And regarding this statement, uh, well, 
I will now give the floor to, to Georg, but maybe this is still a, a, an open option to, to share it with e-commerce and, and, and see uh, if they can uh, also uh, uh, approve it in one way, uh, endorse it uh, rather. So Georg, I, I suggest now you, you present the, the statement uh, while maybe, or defend it, while uh, maybe uh, responding to, uh, to the comment about the level of ambition and uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you. So we, I actually, I, I, I think I just explained how we started. We, we, ha we have uh, asked all the speakers of the today's conference to make proposals, to give contributions to such a kind of a conclusion of our event. And we got a lot of replies and, and, and proposals. And it was, uh, you can imagine, not so easy to compile it to a one document, which actually Pierre, our Pierre from the ACE, did a very good work for that. And he worked for that uh, on, for weeks on that. And uh, so this is the result. I want to say something about the values. I, I think this is a quite a good start because we face a time where, where it's not so clear that what are values. We, have, we face even political situations where all these values, what we think they are obvious, they are undermined. And there is actually a very nice speech of, of Obama in the, in the, in the net who, who explains that we are, if we are not continuing to base our dialogues on facts, we have a problem. We don't, shall not understand each other anymore. And the same is, is about values. If we are not based on the same values, we have a problem at the deep end. We don't need to talk about each other anymore. So this is, you can Google it. It's, it's, it's quite, he is very clear and easy in his wording. And, and therefore, I think it, this is good to start with that, that we say it might be a bit conservative. And, and, uh, but of course, all the political um, gaps are moving. And, and I'm happy to be conservative when we are talking about values, I must say. So I think this is actually, it's needed to say, and it's good to say. So it has, I, I, you, you have it all on your tables. I don't need uh, to explain all the details. It has three chapters in a way. It's our first, the aspects, the relative, relative aspects, cultural aspects, social aspects of the reuse uh, of the built heritage, environmental aspect. It was, most of it was mentioned, economic, of course, also. And then we talk about the processes. We write about the process, flexibility, participation, temporary uses, responsibility of the of competent public authority. It's uh, actually quite important point also. The procurement, multidisciplinarity, Finch financial, viability, good storytelling. And then at the end, it, it's a bit more on the way how to work on the thing, flexible dialogue. I think this is very good and very important. And explains a lot by itself, a reflexive dialogue between past, present, and future. Multiscale territorial approach and case by case and not case by case. It's always case by case, like actually most of the architectonical projects as well are, but especially here, that you cannot have a, a template. It's not working. So this is, a, it shows very clearly that it needs brain. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the, that's the proposal and I, I, I must say I'm happy that we got to a result which we also can, I just missed the headline, I would call it Leowarden uh, statement, it, that it has a name like the Davos Declaration, so it's a bit a follow-up and it's a bit the next step uh, in the right direction, so that's it. If you applaud, then you accept it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you for this. So this is the the outcome of uh, this year's uh, uh, initiative on adaptive reuse. But this is by no way the final word. I mean, the year of cultural heritage uh, is not uh, ending on the 31st of uh, of December. There will be there will be a, a, a follow up. And uh, I mean, we we said about architects uh, earlier today that uh, maybe they are no longer the the orchestra conductors. Uh, well, th this is the same for us. We, we, we have a number of pillars which have been mentioned. One is about sustainability. sustainability. Adaptive reuse is part of it, and we will continue uh, working on it because we can facilitate, uh, help uh, uh, networking, share experience, and, and good practice. That's what we've done throughout the year. And I would uh, sincerely like to thank all the speakers today, not only for, for their participation uh, today, but for their commitment, actually, their availability, and their enthusiasm throughout the year. 
they've, I mean, we've all worked uh, uh, together quite, uh, quite openly, and we will uh, hopefully continue to, to do so. Uh, I will not uh, uh, go further as uh, uh, the conclusions will tell you a bit more about the, the possible uh, next steps. So thank you again uh, to all of you.